In this video, we're going to talk about intermittent claudication. We define claudication as pain in a muscle group brought on by exercise and relieved by rest, which is reproducible. By far the most common location for claudication pain is the calf muscles, but in a small proportion of patients, the pain will be felt in the thigh or in the buttock. The vast majority of claudication is due to arterial issues, but occasionally it can be a feature of spinal problems or deep vein problems. Like a lot of vascular conditions, intermittent claudication is more common in men than women. It increases with age. And in Western type countries, it's thought to affect about 5% of people over the age of 65. While claudication affects about 1 in 20 adults over the age of 65, a lot of other conditions also occur in the leg, which may cause pain or other types of symptoms. So, for instance, patients with arthritis of their hips or their knees may describe pain in their legs, which is worse on weight-bearing, standing for a long time, and is relieved by sitting down. Patients with varicose veins may describe heavy, throbbing legs after prolonged standing or walking. How do we differentiate then actual claudication from these other types of leg symptoms? For claudication, pain must be felt in a muscle. So pain in a hip or a knee or generalized leg throbbing or aching is generally not claudication. Claudication pain is usually cramp-like. It must come on consistently on exercise, meaning it must come on every time the patient exercises, not just occasionally. It must be relieved by rest and it must be reproducible. It has to be happening every time the patient walks a certain distance. As well as establishing the history of their pain, additional features might alert you to the possibility of arterial claudication. You should establish, are they a current or an ex-smoker? Are they diabetic? Have they previous ischemic heart disease or interventions for ischemic heart disease? Previous lower limb revascularization? Have they high blood pressure or high cholesterol? It's also worth establishing if they have a history of back issues, as this may raise the possibility of spinal claudication up the list. It's also worth establishing if they have a previous history of venous thromboembolism, which might make you reconsider venous claudication. Examination findings will be similar to those in a patient with asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease. So you should expect a proximal to distal temperature gradient in the affected leg. The affected foot may be paler than the unaffected side. Hair loss distally and thin, shiny skin distally may be observed. The nails may be hypertrophic and you would expect weak or absent pulses. In order to confirm that your patient has ischemic type claudication, you need to demonstrate the presence of peripheral arterial disease. And you do this by checking their ankle brachial index. If the ankle brachial index is less than 0.9 and the patient has a typical history for arterial claudication, then they have intermittent claudication. Remember though, if the history is atypical, for example, pain in the hip or knee, or heaviness on prolonged standing, then it is unlikely the patient has intermittent claudication, even in the presence of an ABI of less than 0.9. It's more likely they have asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease and something else is causing their symptoms. At this stage, if you have determined for sure that your patient has pain in a muscle group in their leg, brought on consistently by exercise, relieved consistently by rest, and they have an ABI of less than 0.9, then the question becomes whether or not their claudication is lifestyle limiting. Obviously, lifestyle limiting will vary from person to person, but as a rough rule of thumb, if the patient is able to manage to walk 100 metres pain-free, it is unlikely that they have lifestyle limiting claudication. Remember that regardless of their pain-free walking distance, 
60% of Clodicans will die from coronary heart disease and 10% of them will die from stroke. So risk factor modification is essential in all of them. For all of these patients, regardless of their pain-free walking distance, you want to modify their risk factors and rule out related pathology. Risk factor modification, the most important aspect is to stop smoking. And many patients will report a significant improvement in their pain-free walking distance if they can simply get off the cigarettes. In diabetics, it's important to maintain tight glycemic control. They should all be on an antiplatelet and a statin. The other aspect is to rule out related pathology. We said in a previous video that cigarette smokers are prone to abdominal aortic aneurysms. And so it's important that patients presenting with claudication have a AAA scan. Carotid scans, on the other hand, are currently not recommended in the absence of patients with a previous history of neurological deficits. Apart from modifying their risk factors, and looking for other pathology like aneurysms, what else should you do to manage these patients? That depends on whether or not they have non-lifestyle limiting claudication or lifestyle limiting claudication. Non-lifestyle limiting claudication is generally seen in patients who are able to manage more than 100 yards before they develop pain. Although occasionally patients will be reporting shorter pain-free distances, but feel they are not adequately impaired to risk an intervention. Exercise, ideally supervised by a medical professional, is the mainstay of management in these patients. Supervised exercise programs have been shown in meta-analysis of randomized trials to significantly improve the pain-free walking distance. They also need a device regarding the importance of foot and leg care. Accidental injuries to the toes or the feet may precipitate critical limb ischemia in a previously stable claudicant. So I make sure all of my symptomatic claudicants understand that they should wear good solid shoes at all times of the year, and they should keep their legs covered all the way down to the ankles, ideally with heavy trousers or jeans. I'm frequently asked whether or not these patients should be sent for arterial tree imaging of their leg, but they are not going to have a procedure as they are being managed initially with graduated exercise and best medical therapy. Therefore, arterial tree imaging is not going to alter their management and sending them off for scans, be they CT scans or duplex scans, is simply going to waste resources at this stage. They do not need imaging unless they are going for a procedure. What about our patients with lifestyle limiting claudication? These are our patients who have pain at less than 100 yards or who report that their quality of life is significantly impaired by their claudication pain. In these patients, I find that it is useful to have a frank discussion regarding the risks and benefits of potential lower limb revascularization. After this discussion, a proportion of them may elect to continue with medical therapy. Another proportion of them will decide that they wish to proceed with revascularization. And in these patients, it is now essential to arrange prompt lower limb arterial imaging so that they can undergo prompt angioplasty or bypass as indicated. Patients and their families will ask about the prognosis with intermittent claudication. Many of them initially assume it inevitably means they will progress to limb-threatening ischemia or limb loss, but actually many patients avoid these very extreme outcomes. About 50% of patients will report that their symptoms improve on their own. In my experience and many people's experience, this is much more likely if they stop smoking. About 25% will progress to lifestyle-limiting claudication and require an intervention. Between 1 in 10 and 1 in 20 claudicants will go on to develop chronic limb-threatening ischemia. And overall, about 1 in 50 ultimately end up with a major limb amputation. They are actually much more likely to come to harm from either cardiac disease or cerebrovascular disease, with 1 in 3 of these patients dying, usually from a cardiovascular cause, within 5 years of diagnosis.
Remember to give us a like if you found the video useful and think about subscribing to the channel. As always, if you want the written revision notes, they're available free of charge at vasculartutor.com.